On September 30th, 1770, George Whitfield, I got a little bit of feedback um, up here, so if somebody could, could help me back in the soundboard. Um, George Whitfield passed away. Just hours before, even with his failing health, he preached his last sermon about faith and works, all while standing on top of a large barrel. Now, this was very fitting for Mr. Whitfield as he was quoted saying, I would rather wear out than rust out. I would rather wear out than rust out. This was the life of George, preaching salvation by faith wherever and to whoever would hear. In fact, it is believed that at the time of George Whitfield's death in 1770, check this out, 80% of all people who lived in the American colonies had heard George preach at least one sermon during their lifetime. 80% of every single person who was alive in the American colonies had heard George Whitfield preach a sermon at some point during their life. That's phenomenal. They have said that he preached over 18,000 sermons during his life. 18,000. George Whitfield played a major role in the Great Awakening in the late 1700s, but the question is, is how did we get there? Now, before we dig into that, I want to, to remind some of you or maybe introduce some of you for the first time what we are doing right now. We are in a series called Monuments, in, uh, called Monuments, and what we've been doing is we've been taking these rocks and we have been stacking them in remembrance of heroes of our faith from before. From since Christ had died and the disciples had died, from there to the point of now, we have been trying to remember those who have done great things because of the call of God on their life and just remembering them. We're doing this as an idea because God often did that in the Old Testament. Whenever there would be a great move, they would build an altar in remembrance of what God did. In fact, whenever he brought the people and he was taking them over to Jericho to do the whole march around, they had to cross over another river on dry ground, and he says, I want one person from all 12 tribes, grab a rock and take it with you. And this was a significant size rock, a lot larger than the ones we're carrying them, because, probably because the, the men carrying them were a lot larger than me, and I didn't want to make awkwardness trying to lift one and then needing help and then splitting my pants. So we made them small, but they took large rocks with them, 12 tribes, each to their own, and they said, do this, the Lord commanded them, do this, so that when your children look over, they ask, why do you have that rock, Daddy? Why does that rock sit in the middle of our, in our town? Why is that rock there? And he, you could go back and tell the stories of what God had done previously to remind them that God was faithful then and he'll be faithful again. That God called us to something great then and he'll, he's still calling us to something great now. And so we have been doing the same. We are not worshiping these people. We're not building up altars for these people. We are just simply placing rocks to remember that God has been moving a lot longer before you ever reach this place. And he is going to be moving a lot longer after you leave this place. But what is God going to be doing through you while you are here in this place? So we're going to place this rock today um, for George Whitfield. But first, that very bottom rock was for St. George the Dragon Slayer. Myths have been written about him and stories have been embellished to help, help people cause, uh, it, it drove people for their own agenda. But when you really look back on the history of St. George, he was actually a martyr who stood up to the emperor of Rome and said, I will not denounce my faith. I will not turn my back on Jesus and I will not harm other Christians either. I will stand up for them. And he was tortured and martyred for his faith in 300 AD. And it reminds us that sometimes we just in, in order to stand up for what God is asking us to do, it might take us to places that are uncomfortable, but it doesn't change the fact that it's still necessary to be faithful to Christ even to the end. Amen, church? So that first one's for St. George. The second one was last week. We talked about Martin Luther. We talked about his great sacrifice and the awakening in his heart that he began to recognize that, that it wasn't works and deeds that saved you as he had often learned growing up, but it was actually, it was the mercy and the grace and the sacrifice of Jesus that would renew your soul. And he also, he drove it to the point that he wanted the, Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church to change. He wanted them to see the error of what had happened, but they refused to, and because of that, the great reformation began to come out of that. And so as he did that, he also saw that there was one dynamic piece that had to change. The word of God needed to be translated into languages that common people could read. 
And we talked about last week how one of the greatest ways to honor him besides this rock that means nothing, if you wanna honor If you want to honor Martin Luther, read the word of God because he sacrificed a lot to make sure that it was put in your language because he watched a church die and be strangled to death by religion because people didn't know their word of God. But now we have the opportunity to, and how many of you guys, we talked about that, how many of us have multiple Bibles in our home? Multiple, and often they end up collecting more dust than we realize simply because we take for granted the great sacrifice that those who went before us have made so that we could make sure that we are connected to Christ and that if I was to ever err in the way that I preach, if Pastor Travis came up here, started preaching outside of the scripture, there are many of you in this room that could call that out because you have one, you can read it and you can realign with the word of God and what the church is meant to be. So that we talked about that, and so now we're going to dig into a, another soul that God used to awaken his church from apathy and sleepwalking, Pastor George Whitfield. Now listen along as we read about his life written from his perspective. It says, my mother came at me with an angry look. George, I hear you've been missing school again. I looked away trying not to let her see my guilt. Mother thought that getting me an education at St. Mary de Crypt Grammar School was the answer to our money troubles. She had worked hard to keep our families in operating, especially since my father died when I was two years old. But at 15 years old, all I could think, was, all I could think of was quitting school. Finally, I told her, Mother, I just want to quit school and work in the inn. But I thought you enjoyed giving presentations at school, she said. I do, Mother. I like acting and I, and I like making up scenes and I love giving speeches to the other students that they, and they enjoy it. But you know how the teachers feel. They don't like me at all. I feel like that every 15-year-old teacher has told that, to, or 15-year-old kid has told that to their parents at some time. Mom, she just don't like me. They just don't give me a chance. So even George Whitfield saying, they don't like me at all. The thing is, is it was true. Mother couldn't deny that the, what the teacher said about me. George Whitfield is wasting his time. What good can come from all this play acting, they asked. Finally, my mother gave in. All right, George, you may leave school. And for almost two years, I wore an apron, I washed cups, and I cleaned rooms while enjoying lively conversations with the customers at the inn. Most of them didn't believe in God, and I joined in their discussions. No one would have ever guessed that late into the night, I often sat up studying my Bible. As the weeks passed, I began to sense a new calling, one that would surprise those who knew me. One night, as the last customer lingered to play cards, I sat by my mother in front of the roaring fire, and I shared my private dream. Mother, I'd like to become a preacher. Her faded eyes lit up with joy. That's wonderful, George. But then she reminded me of the challenges I would face. You realize it won't be easy to finish your education since you dropped out of school. Just then a man interrupted our conversation. Woman, I need a room. As my mother left to tend to the counter, I felt her hand on my shoulder. Don't worry, son. God will make a way. And he did. Through extra hours at the inn and careful spending, I was able to work my way through Pembroke College at Oxford University. It was there that I met John and Charles Wesley and decided to live a life of sacrifice and obedience to God. I really wanted to know God, and I wanted to be assured of my salvation, but it seemed that even the strict discipline didn't seem to help me. But finally, I read a book called The Life of God and the Soul of Man by Henry Scougal. I learned that good works and self-discipline couldn't save my soul. I learned that salvation is a free gift. I needed to be born again. Finally, I was sure of my salvation, and I couldn't wait to share the good news with the people of England. But I was disappointed with what I saw in English churches. The people's hearts had grown cold. Listen to this, church. They went to church out of obligation not because they wanted to learn about God, not because they desired to worship him, but simply because it's what they always did. Also, many of the ministers of the Anglican church tended to preach dry, dull sermons. When I finally became an ordained pastor, I set out to deliver the gospel in fresh ways, using that old flair for the dramatic from my school days. Sometimes this involves shouting and dancing. How could I stand still when telling people, you must be born again? Once in a while, I even wept 
but it wasn't for the show. People were living hopelessly apart from Christ, and their dilemma moved me to tears. Needless to say, needless to say my style didn't always go over very well. Mr. Whitfield, I heard more than once, if you were to preach in my church, you must tone it down. Don't be so loud. Don't flail about so much. What do you mean by all that prancing around? It made, when I read this, it made me think of Pastor Travis. Like, I was like, he totally would have been in trouble all the time. But how could I stop being energized about Christ and the salvation he offers to lost, lost people? There was, however, a price to pay for my zeal. I couldn't get a job in a church since most churches wouldn't have me. Fortunately, God had a different plan. God put within my heart a strong desire to reach the unchurched as well as those who were tired of stale religion. Why not preach to the masses in the open air, in fields, outside of town? Most of the thousands of people who came to listen enjoyed hearing the gospel presented with such energy. But of course, sometimes the crowd would grow angry when I called them to repent. One time, a mob came at me to murder uh, with murder on their minds, but I managed to escape. People often threw fruit, vegetables, and even dead cats at me sometimes. Please, no cats in our church today. Thank you. Maybe my unusual storytelling techniques hadn't gone over well with my teachers in school, but they helped me as a preacher. Once, I gave a vivid description of a storm at sea. The tempest raged. The wind howled as torrential rain crashed against the ship. The captain lost control of the vessel. It pitched and heaved in the crushing waves while the mast split like so much kindling. The breakup of the ship seemed inevitable. My story was interrupted by a sailor in the crowd who suddenly cried out, to the lifeboats, to the lifeboats. I guess he got so caught up in my story that he couldn't help himself. Other times people fell to the floor from conviction when I preached. In the late 1730s, God called me to America to share his love because churches weren't doing much better there than in England as well. As in my native land, Americans just weren't used to my kind of preaching. Once again, I took to the open air and the freedom to be myself. And in Philadelphia, a young printer named Benjamin Franklin, he conducted a, an experiment while listening to me. I wanna see how far I can go and still hear your voice, he said. What made you think of that, I asked. I enjoy conducting experiments, he explained. And so he did. After the meeting that night, he reported, I made it all the way to the Delaware River. That's a mile away, and I could still hear you. I asked, but did you actually listen? Ben smiled and shook his head no. Though Ben never accepted Christ that I know of, he did support my efforts. I lodged above his shop and even printed my, ser he even printed my sermons so that people could buy them. His belief in free speech led him to purchase a building so all preachers could have a place to speak. The two of us became the best of friends, and although Ben always resisted my efforts to convert him, he never quite understood that how far my voice carried to people's ears did not matter nearly as much as the reception it got in people's hearts. I traveled across the Atlantic Ocean a total of 13 times, and everywhere I went, I preached the gospel of Christ and repentance in the only way I knew how. Excited. Tonight, we set a stone for Pastor George Whitfield. We often take for granted the type of music we listen to, even the ability to have lights, to have a sound system, to have energetic movement and motion. We take for granted people like Pastor Travis who have zeal when he preached. Have you ever seen Travis come up here? Has he ever bored you? But that was normal of the day. And yet we look and someone like George Whitfield who was personal, perfectly placed at the time, a, a guy that went through theater school and learned to act and he could project his voice. They said he would speak to crowds of 25,000 plus with not one bit of amplification and people could still hear him. What a man, what a gifting that God would call and he would use them in order to reach thousands and thousands. They said whenever he preached in Philadelphia, there was about, they estimated between 25 and 35,000 people. And they said on that day, that was the largest crowd ever in history that one person spoke to at one single event. All because he had a flair and a call. 
He used his giftings and the call that he had. God used George Whitfield to invigorate the church and to help the church wake up. Beyond this stone, and we set it here and we do it just as a remembrance because how many of you guys knew who George Whitfield was before tonight? Isn't it crazy that somebody could make such an impact and just a few hundred years later, we don't even recognize his name? We have no concept. And I'm not knocking anyone. I'm saying how quickly we forget. And yet God did something amazing during that time, and that should be something that we hang on to and go, God still, God was working then. He can still work now. He can use me. So beyond this stone, beyond this just remembrance of him, what is it that we can get from this man's history? What can we learn as, church, as a church? I got four points, and then we'll get you out of here. Number one. Where you are now does not determine where God might take you. Where you are right now does not necessarily determine where God wants to take you. I look back on the life of George, and, and do you realize at one point George was just simply waiting tables and cleaning hotel rooms? Would you ever think that somebody in that scenario would become one of the most well-known speaking pastors to ever live? Somebody that would literally travel thousands and thousands and thousands of miles to make 13 trips across the... How many of you guys have ever crossed the Atlantic? How many of you guys have crossed the Atlantic? How many of you crossed the Atlantic five times or more? Ten times or more? He did it 13 and they did it on a boat. That is phenomenal. Somebody just willing to go to that land. They said he went to, to Ireland and he preached there and, he, and he, it said he preached until three o'clock in the morning with thousands and thousands of people attending this. And he was just simply somebody who served tables and cleaned hotel rooms. God has a place for you. God has a direction for you. And where you are right now does not determine where that will be. So many times we tend to look at our surroundings and our circumstances and we let that define what we can be. We, let, we look at that and say, I could never do that. Do you not see where I'm at? And yet I want you to remember that the life of George Whitfield at one time was just simply serving in a hotel room. But the crazy thing is, is he needed to be there. He needed to be there in order to get his call. Where you are might be exactly where God wants you. In or, sometimes it's just to motivate you for something better. I've always said college kids... Like, have you ever, when you're going through college and it just gets hard and you're like, I don't want to do it anymore, one of the greatest things you can do during the summer is go work road construction. Go stand out there when it's 100 degrees and the asphalt's melting and it's horrible. Why? Because you'll say, I will do anything to get off this road and get back into class and do more so that I can have some other job than this. And that's the same thing. Sometimes God has you in a place so that you'll, it'll be motivate you to go further and push further. Sometimes he has you because you're gonna be introduced to somebody who needs to be a part of your puzzle piece to get you where you're going. But where you are now does not determine where God wants to take you, amen? Number two, God always reveals himself to those who seek him. How many of you guys have ever wanted to hear from God? He goes, man, I just wanna hear from you. How many of you guys just ever, like, man, if God would just give me direction, Man, if I could, I just never feel him. I don't seem to ever experience him. Do you not recognize that often the people who get those encounters, it's because of what they've done behind the scenes before, you have, before they ever got to that moment? Think of George Whitfield. When he worked at that hotel cleaning up, it says he would have all the conversations and the earthly talk with all the people in the day. But when he went to bed at night, he started reading and studying the word of God because he needed something. He didn't sit there and yell at God and say, speak to me, speak to me. He went and sought after him, and he was looking for him. But not just that, when he finally made it to school, he started hanging out with other people of like faith, people that had a stronger faith than him. He started hanging out with John and Charles Wesley, and he saw that they, their, their deep devotion and their dedication to the Lord, and it began to rub off on him, and he's like, I want to be like that. Some of you, you are not experiencing God because of who you've surrounded yourself with. Some of you, the people around you are hindering you from your relationship with God, not spurring you on. 
Sometimes it's simply because you choose to watch one more video, one more show. You, to, you choose to go to bed just a little earlier rather than taking time to spend with God. And therefore, you're not encountering him because you are not chasing after him. He wants to meet with you. He wants to be there for you. But you got to push in. I can tell you, man, some of the, the biggest fires to ever exist. Things don't just catch fire because there's fire. Something has to be put into that fire. You can't just stand somewhere near it. You can't just look in the back and go, man, that's a big fire back there. I hope I catch fire. Sometimes you're going to have to get off your butt and go get in them flames so you can experience it too. Number three, not everything that God calls you to will be popular or received by everyone. George Whitfield was one of the most loved men. There was a story. This was a, story, a historical account of a farmer who all of a sudden he got, he got wind that, that George Whitfield was going to be preaching 12 miles away. He was out in his farm when he heard about this and he said, they're starting in one hour. He threw down his tools and he took off sprinting to his house. He grabbed his wife by the arm and grabbed his horse and began to run. They both jumped on top of the horse and they began to ride. He said he rode until the horse could not breathe anymore. And then he jumped off the horse and he told the wife, run this horse as far as you can. Do not pull the reins and do not stop. And he sprinted as far as he could alongside that horse to keep making momentum. And they kept doing it and he jumped back on the horse and ride for a little bit. Horse would get tired, he'd jump off and he'd sprint as hard as he could while his wife rode the horse. And he says as he got there, he began to, they, they got near the field where George Whitfield was going to be. They got near to it and he said you could see boats pulling into the harbor and large groups of men running in to get close to this. And he says he barely, narrowly made it and he says what he heard that day changed his life forever. He goes, I never experienced a relationship with God like that until after I'd heard George Whitfield. He was one of the most loved men and people passionately sought after to hear the gospel from him because of the way he made it come alive. But not everyone loved him. He believed deeply in repentance. He believed deeply in the grace of Jesus Christ. He wanted people to recognize. People would get offended because he would speak to people and he'd say, do you not understand that you are filth? You are wretched you are nothing. You are the bottom of nothing. Have you guys ever, have you, how many of you guys have a crawl space under your house? You're not fortunate enough to have the full basement. You got a crawl space. Have you ever gone under there? Like that's nasty. That's nasty. You're worse than that. Like that was George Whitfield. He wanted people to understand their depravity because when you understood your depravity, then you could recognize the grace of Jesus Christ and your need for him. And he would preach that, but people didn't often like hearing that. Some people get mad, and that's where they started throwing dead cats. I, how do you even come up with that? Like, I mean, it, yeah, it's just be polite, get up, walk out, act like you got to go to the bathroom, then leave. Don't start throwing dead cats. It's just wrong. But that's the thing. When God calls you to something, so many times we see people take like three steps, they face opposition, and then they crumble. Well, I guess that's not what God wanted. But you look all through his life, man, he, he, had, to, he had to fight in order to get where God was taking him. And it was in those fights and it was in that determination that he would build more and more strength and more and more character that would allow him to go further and further. The great religions of that time, they were bothered by him because that's just not the way they were used to doing it. They were very stoic and very reserved and there wasn't a lot of movement or excitement going on. And because he did it different, that offended them because they failed to recognize that the method is not sacred, but the message is. How he did it, how we do it, how it's done anywhere doesn't matter. But is Christ being preached? And that's what mattered. And he made that, and it, that bothered and rubbed people the wrong way. But here's the thing. He kept going, and he kept pushing. And even against that, all that opposition, now we have churches all across our land that are absolutely excited for the grace of Jesus Christ. They, we have churches you go into, guys, you, you, they make our worship team look like old hymnals. Like, there is so much excitement going on because somebody was willing to push through the boundaries that had not yet been set, even though he faced opposition. And so in your, same li in your life, God is going to call you. And let me just tell you this, more than likely you will face opposition. But if what you are doing and what you are called to do is biblical, let me preface it with that. If you're like, I'm pretty sure that I'm supposed to kill people. I feel like God's told me 
God wills it. I'm gonna go ahead and question you and I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna offer some opposition to you right now and say, mm, I don't think so. That's not really biblical. That's not. But if what God is calling you to do, it lines up with the word of God, man, sometimes you're gonna face that opposition and maybe even from church folk. Because let's be honest, we can get a little stuck in our ways sometimes. We can kind of, I just miss the good old days of music. I miss how it used to be. I miss, we, and we do because we're human and we get stuck, but sometimes we gotta push past that. I'm talking to this group right here, world changers. Right there, world changers. We're gonna get, us old people are gonna get in your way sometimes. That doesn't mean stop, it just means keep going and let God reveal himself. We'll shut up when God shows up. We're like, oh, never mind. We don't wanna stand in the way of that. You gotta keep pushing. Number four. As you've heard before, those that fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. The state of the church, if you look throughout history, and as I research all these great heroes of faith, like do you realize like I'm researching, but I'm spanning like five and 600 year spans? There are so many people in between there, but you guys would kill me because we'd be going to like 2022 on history lessons with Chase. I'm just trying to pick some out, but what I do is I recognize that like every 100 years, the church has fallen apart. No matter what, no matter who shows up and does what, Martin Luther comes in there and man, people are stirred up and they're ready and man, we're tired of this old stodgy religion that has no relationship and no excitement. Man, we want to change. And yet now 200 years, England's back to the old mm, stoic and no life and no one's being saved because the church always drifts towards apathy. Think about the Jews. When you think about like, like what really angers God, you can look at Jesus if you wanna know how, how, how God feels about things, look at Jesus. How many times did Jesus confront a sinner and yell at him? Never. How many times did somebody break a, break a law and Jesus was like, I'm going, oh, I'm so upset with you right now? Never. He often dealt with it with compassion. He, he still spoke truth. I love the woman that was thrown down in the act of adultery and he says, I, nor do I condemn you. I'm not condemning you, but then he also said a new preface, but go and sin no more. I still have, there still is a standard and I still am calling you to more, but I'm not condemning you. And yet, when he, who, when did Jesus get angry? When he dealt with religious leaders. That's when you see Jesus flipping out. Like you guys need to stop getting upset with the sin you see in the world. You need to be upset when you start seeing religiosity start winning out. When it wins out in your community, when it wins out in your own heart, when you start looking around and if somebody walks through the door and you go, why are they here? They don't belong here. I saw them in the paper just two weeks ago. They got arrested. What are they? When you start seeing that, you need to get angry with that junk because Jesus is mad at it. He has a righteous indignation and he is flipping over the tables in the temple and he's saying, that does not belong. But see, he, he fought against that because the Jewish religion had become basically, you need to become like us before you'll ever belong to us. And that wasn't Jesus at all. Jesus says, come and belong and I'll help you begin to look like. You are, I accept you just as you are and then I'll start changing you. Then I'll start building on you. But that's not what Jewish religion was. But see, the same thing happened in the Roman Catholic Church. They were all high and mighty, and you had to be just like them. And if you didn't fit the mold, you didn't belong. They had become apathetic towards the mission of Christ. And so you see that get disrupted by somebody else. But then again, you go back to the Anglicans, and now it was all about, they hated the way George Whitfield was because they thought that just wasn't proper enough. But what I don't understand is when did Jesus model propriety? When did Jesus ever stand up there in a really nice suit and say everything really well? Or or was he more like the people? He spent time with the people. He understood and he had compassion and 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 he mingled in with the people. And yet somehow the church becomes this social club. This country club that you can try to belong to. Now here's where I want, here's this is the last thing. This is what I'm trying to warn you against. That's exactly what you will become if you do not keep motivating yourself to stay about the mission of Christ. And you say, well, no, I yes, you will, because you're human. Because we want to be special. 
We want to be select. We want to have our behavior be modeled for something, and we want to make this club really tough to get into because that makes us feel important. That's who we are. We're just like everybody else. But if we study and remember history and we watch the church, the church fell apart even after Jesus came. What makes you think that you won't? You have to stay sharp. That's something that the, the life of George Whitfield, you have to stay sharp, you have to stay alert, and you have to stay awake. You cannot forget the mission of Christ. What is the mission of Christ? To seek and save that which is lost. If your life does nothing to help lost people, you are already becoming sleepy. You are already falling asleep at the wheel of the mission of Christ because that is what he was about. He's not into behavior modification. He's not into making you good boys and good girls so that you can look good and, and look nice and dress nice. And all. He's not into that. He's into finding the people that are lost and redeeming them and bringing them into the family so that they too can sing, I am a child of God. But I'm telling you, here's what I've really learned. God keeps having to bring these people to motivate everyone. And usually why it happens is because people want to blame the church. Well, if my pastor just, well, if he would speak this way, well, if she would do this, if the worship team would just sing this, well, if they would just have more discipleship, well, if their child care was better, if they would do, we often want to blame the church and we blame the religious organizations for the state of the church. But the truth is, is every great awakening wasn't, didn't happen in the church. It's when the people of the church begin to wake up. Yeah, exactly, because I don't influence culture, you do. It's not what we do from up on this stage that influences culture. What determines you staying awake and staying alert is your willingness to pursue Christ and do his mission, period. So I challenge you, church, don't look at where you are and think that God is limiting you or think that you don't have something great in your future. God is wanting to take you. But in that same vein, if you want to go about what God is doing, you wanna encounter him and get a call from him, then you need to start pursuing him. You need to be studying the word of God late at night, early in the morning. You need to surround yourself with believers who have been doing this longer than you, who can speak life and wisdom into you. And you need to be reading other sources. Think, when it all came down to it, even after George had done all that, it took him reading another book from another man and something woke him up. Are you finding knowledge about God even outside of the normal realms in order that you could keep being fed? When you do, you will encounter him. And when you encounter him and you start moving into your dreams, you will face opposition. Don't stop. That's a good sign. It means that God is using you to do something different than has been done before. And so keep pushing through. And always, always, always stay alert, stay sharp, and do not fall asleep at the wheel because you are driving the mission of Christ to seek and save that which is lost. Let's pray. Father God, we are so grateful and honored to be able to take a moment and remember somebody who made such a great impact. Hours before his death, he was still preaching the gospel and he was helping people understand faith versus works and why faith always wins. God, I pray that myself, that those who heard tonight would have a fire placed in us to realize that your mission isn't finished and that you still wanna use us. You still wanna grow us. We're still being sanctified and made new every day. But in the midst of that, to not sit on the sidelines and not become too stoic, too blah, too bland, but may we be excited for the gospel and what it's done in our lives and what it can do for others. God, there, there are people in this church that have friends that don't know you. I pray you'd give them boldness to speak to them. There are people in this church that have family members that have, have gone astray from you or not close to you or have maybe never even met you. I pray you'd give them boldness and excitement that they could speak the gospel to them. But we have a community here that is hurting, that is broken, and they need your truth. And they need it in a way that's exciting, not just for show, but because the gospel is exciting. May we be the George Whitfields of our time and in our world. It may not be to 25,000, it might. But for whatever it is and whatever we're surrounded with, may we be excited to share the gospel and for the mission of Christ to seek and save that which is lost. Bless us and go with us. 
In the name of Jesus, everybody says, amen. God bless you, church.